Welcome to the Potter Blog site, August 18th, 2012. And alert this evening, we have detected persistent long half-life uh, radiation in the fallout from the August 8th, 12 storms. Uh, basically, what we've detected is a continuing long half-life radioactive material averaging 0.04 counts uh, per second. And that's based on the back end of this uh, curve here. Uh, we got these readings from our uh, lead cave. And that's where we take uh, two precision uh, pancake gagger counters, put them inside a set of lead bricks inside of a lead line box, and we've taken continuous readings for the last 10 days. Uh, this chart is the result of those readings. Uh, one thing to note about this chart, it is a logarithmic chart, uh, so you won't actually see a zero value, and the values increase by factors of 10, 0.1, 1, 10, 100. Uh, because this, uh, the scale was so high, we decided to show it logarithmic. In a logarithmic chart, the uh, exponential curves appear straight lines. You'll see three regions here. First is the uh, short half-life region, which has a, uh, had a, approximately a 32-minute half-life. Uh, that's a composite half-life. We suspect that's uh, typical radon daughters. And then we've got a medium half-life region here. And we also have a long half-life region here all the way out to here. Now the key thing to notice here is you'll see uh, these red lines and these green lines. Uh, the red lines where we've taken this data and uh, used a uh, basically a one hour average, a one hour moving average that helps smooth the data a little bit for us and uh, gets rid of any negative values that allows us to use these trend lines. And because we have long half-life radiation in it, uh, the long half-life radiation uh, makes a composite with this medium half-life radiation so we have to subtract it out so basically we subtracted out 0.04 counts per second from this red line and we got this new green line so basically what that means is the medium half-life radiation has approximately a 9.8 uh, hour half-life if we did not subtract out the long half-life radiation it would have shown as a 16.4 hour half-life now the key things to notice here are where these uh, lines extend to uh, the short half-life radiation basically stops influencing the Geiger counter right around in here, which is, you can see in less than 500 minutes, the short half-life stuff's burned off and is no longer influencing. Uh, the medium half-life stuff, uh, you can see, stops influencing the Geiger counter easily by about five, that little bit over 5,000 minutes. So what we did was we took our readings on the long half-life stuff uh, out here at the 6,000 minute mark. Now, if you'll notice that these are above zero, this is the uh, difference between the radiation measured uh, by this Geiger counter, and we subtract the background radiation measured by this Geiger counter. And so what we get is uh, this composite graph. And just to show you the data, here's just a quick look at some of the data. Now the one thing to note here is the average background radiation was a 0.361 uh, counts uh, per second. That was the average background radiation over this time period. So let's get back on here. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to zoom in and show you this chart with uh, uh, in sort of a normal layout so you can see that these, these readings don't go to zero. So I'm going to uh, scroll on down to the same chart, but now what I've done is uh, basically zoomed in from uh, minus 0.08 seconds to plus 0.1 seconds. And this is no longer logarithmic. This is a, a normal chart. And that's why these, uh, uh, these half-life curves are now look like curves. Key notice here, this is the zero line. If the... Uh, Notice how everything is above the zero line. So when we subtract the radiation from the paper towel swipe, we subtract from it the background radiation. If there's nothing on the paper towel swipe, it should read zero. It should bounce around zero. What it actually does is it bounces around uh, 0.04 counts per second. And what you'll see here is this is a one hour uh, moving average of this radiation. And if you notice, it actually looks like it's slightly increasing. Now that might be from some ingrowth because this is probably likely a mix of various radioactive materials of long half-life. Uh, the half-life is long enough that 
to try to figure it out using Geiger counters and try to estimate what material it is. It might take us months to years to get enough data to try to do it. So that makes it not worthwhile to attempt to identify the half-life. The key thing is, is that there's stuff hanging around. And this is where you'll find your uh, cesium-137s, your barium-140s, just a whole mix of stuff in here. Now, what I'm going to compare this to is we had a storm previous to this on July 29th. That was 37 times over background. And that storm was unusual in that it did not have long half-life radiation in it. In fact, it's the first one of these we've measured that did not have long half-life radiation in it. And I'm going to switch over to uh, that Excel chart now. So this is the July 29th storm, and it's the same uh, resolution as the previous one. Point, minus 0 0.08 counts per second to 0 0.1 counts per second. We subtracted the uh, readings from... Uh, paper towel swipe Geiger counter, we subtracted from it the background uh, radiation Geiger counter. And what you'll notice here is the zero line. And you will see that when you subtract these out, this thing balances right on the zero line. And if I put in a long moving average here, this moving average will go right on the zero line. We have not been able to detect any long half-life radiation in this July 29th uh, uh, fallout. Now, this is unusual. This is unusual. Now we were able to measure some medium half-life uh, radioactivity and you'll see this here in this green section and this is a uh, one hour moving average here. Again we had to take this one hour moving average to get rid of the non the non negative uh, the negative numbers and the zero values to get this trend line to, to calculate in Excel it comes out with about a 7.5-hour uh, half-life. The fit's not that well, so you know, it could be plus or minus uh, a few hours easily. Now let's uh, look at this chart in a little larger format. So I'll scroll up. Now this is not logarithmic, but this shows uh, where we started recording. This was initially 37 times background and we started recording I think about taking data about two hours after we took the sample and what you'll see is again the short half-life radiation section with a 30.2 minute half-life then down here the medium half-life section with a 7.5 hour half-life and then you notice the rest of it's on zero all of this is zero meaning there was no long half-life radiation in here and again that's very unusual post Fukushima and we have some theories about that, but let me show you the, uh, what the background radiation was when we measured it. Uh, the background radiation was 0.359 counts per second. Uh, if you remember in the other chart, it was 0.361. So over these uh, little over two week period there, uh, background radiation averages remained uh, relatively steady. Now let's go back and look at the, uh, the chart where we did detect uh, the radioactivity. Now here's the thing to notice, is the radioactivity is there, but we don't know what it is. We don't know what this long half-life radioactivity is. From our risk mitigation perspective, it doesn't really matter what it is. It's something that uh, shouldn't be there. There's only so many things we can do to risk mitigate. And that means we stay out of the rain, basically we avoid dairy products, anything that concentrates radioactivity. Now, there have been other detections out there of people who have been able to identify cesium-137. But uh, one thing you'll notice is they don't do paper towel swipes and test the paper towels. You know, that's the interesting thing. They also don't really understand what their uh, minimum detection limits are. Now, what people will claim is, is that they can't identify what this is, therefore it doesn't exist. You know, that's the functional equivalent of saying uh, your neighbor's been murdered, but because you can't identify who murdered your neighbor, the neighbor's not really murdered. You know, this is the equivalent to listening in on a radio station and being able to hear music but not knowing which station it is, not knowing the call letters. You know there's a radio station there, and you know it's broadcasting, 
but you don't know what the call letters are. This is very concerning that long half-life radiation still remains in our uh, in our weather. One other thing this also correlates well to is when we have these high detections, like this 91 times over background, I think was the third highest uh, detection we've ever had. There is always a correlating detection of uh, iodine-131 in sewage in Japan that correlates to a time period that matches up with uh, these detections here in St. Louis. And one other thing that we've uh, noticed is uh, we've had a professional gamma spectrometry done on beef here in Missouri, grass-raised, grass-fed, well-watered beef. And after Fukushima, there was a cesium-137 detection. There was also a barium-140 indication, which is a short half-life. In the three tests we've done of pre-Fukushima beef, Fukushima beef from shortly after the accident, and recent uh, beef, when there's been detections of cesium-137 in beef, there have also been detections of these short half-life compounds. Now what we believe is going on is that um, the groundwater in Japan is radioactive. It's usually very radioactive with uh, naturally occurring radon. Uh, the earthquakes tend to make it more so. Uh, Fukushima, the jet stream goes directly over Fukushima. The corium, the melted through fuel, heats up the groundwater and steams out the naturally occurring radon in the groundwater. That raises the radon levels in the jet stream, which we detect the, the radon daughters. Oh, looks like looks like we have a radon daughter crawling right across the screen. But uh, also with this naturally occurring radon being pumped out of Fukushima, when we get these large spikes, this is indicative that the that this radon that was in the groundwater that was steamed out of the groundwater came into contact with fuel rods, and along with the natural radon is the radioactivity that's coming out of the fuel rods but it's much harder to detect. That's why the radon is a good risk mitigation indicator, especially when it's at high peak levels. And that's what we look for, risk mitigation. Stay out of the rain. Good night.